Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So, um, this presentation is uh, giving a bit of historical background to embedded Linux. Um, uh, let's get back to for a minute. So uh, it, it started off when uh, I got an email from a, a journalist who said, um, I'm doing this article about the uh, Linux and the milestones in, in Linux. Um, you look like a kind of guy who knows a bit about embedded Linux. Can you just fill in the embedded part of it for me? So I thought I'd just shoot, shoot a quick email back saying, yeah, 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 this, this, and this. And then I started looking into it and started researching stuff. And I realized there's a whole bunch of stuff that I'd either forgotten uh, or, in many cases, didn't know at all. So I thought, hmm, I better write this stuff down. It could be interesting. <coughs> so that's this presentation. Uh, standard old license there. Skip that. A little bit about me. So I've been working with embedded Linux uh, for some time now, since 1999. Um, I kind of came into Linux from an odd angle. I actually came in from the embedded side. I I'm, I'm I'm, have been an embedded engineer for a long, long time. And then somebody said, you should try this Linux stuff out. That was in 1999. After initially telling them they were crazy, I said, well, OK, maybe it will work. And it's been working ever since. Um, and I've been working around with Android since then as well. You can find out more about me from these places here. We'll come back to that later on. That's not so important. So Linux then, embedded Linux. How did it come to be the dominant operating system in the world? So I'm going to talk uh, about how that happened. This isn't just a trip down memory lane, although that's part of the appeal to it. But it also kind of fills in with the stuff that Tim was talking about in his, in his keynote uh, yesterday about where is embedded Linux going next. We've got to this point here. What do we do now? Is it too big? Is it too small? Is it the wrong, uh, the wrong technology or whatever? So again, having some context behind that helps, hopefully, us to look at where we are now and where we should go next. Incidentally, I'd be more than happy as we go through this. If anybody has any particular recollections or um, particular knowledge about the various things I'm going to be talking about, like if you were there doing the thing I'm mentioning, please uh, tell me, because uh, there are a couple of key things here that you may recognize. So um, the early days. I'm, I'm starting in 1995 as the first significant uh, year for embedded Linux. Now, Linux had been used in what you might call embedded environments previous to this, but I'm going to mark this as a year zero for, uh, for the embedded part of things. And the first interesting thing that happened is that a guy called Bruce Perrins, uh, who was working on the Debian uh, distribution, uh, he really wanted to be able to create a bootable floppy disk so that you could install Debian uh, from a floppy. Put the floppy in the drive and control out Dell, off you go. Incidentally, a lot of you may not remember this these kind of days. Th this is what a floppy disk looks like. <laughs> For those of you, <laughs> thank you. For those of you who are either uh, too young to remember or too old and have forgotten. <laughs> I'm in the latter category. So yeah, this, this is what we used to use, guys. Yeah, well, the thing about floppy disks, they're not floppy. Yes. Why is that? So OK, so five inch. Five inch kind of predates Linux. By the time Linux came along, we were pretty much onto the uh, three and a half inch non-floppy floppy disks. So there you go. I could have bought in an eight inch floppy. That would have been really, really retro. Anyhow, uh, so floppy disks, Bruce Perrins. So he came up with this thing called BusyBox, which meant that you could create uh, using BusyBox and a Linux kernel and uh, a, a simple uh, cut down uh, C library. You could actually create an entire Linux distribution, put it onto a floppy disk, boot it. 
So that solved his install problem, but it also gave us a useful tool for embedded devices. And ever since then, the majority, or at least a large number of embedded devices, have been using BusyBox as, uh, as one of their core components. So I'm dating this as the start of, of embedded Linux as we, as we know it. In 1997, uh, a guy called uh, Dave Singhi, I think that's how you pronounce it, uh, he took the concept, he took BusyBox, floppy disk, and he created the Linux router project, LRP. Many people say this actually is the first embedded uh, example. It wasn't embedded in that we were still built, booting PCs, but it meant that you could take this floppy disk, plug it in to your PC, reboot, and you had a router, or router, as you would say. A year later, uh, another couple of guys, Dave Tatt and uh, Greg Witkowski, uh, they took the, the, the concept a little bit further. They actually added in uh, a wireless link between two PCs running uh, uh, LRP and gave us essentially the first wireless router. And there's a fairly celebrated document called the Arlon Wireless How-To, uh, which was quoted in some prior, as a prior art in a patent case some years back. So it is officially the first wireless Linux router. Okay, next thing then. Um, Portability of Linux is kind of crucial. The fact that we can run it on a wide range of different processor architectures uh, is kind of useful. So Linux, although it was originally written to run on a 386 Intel processor, even by 1995, it was running on a variety of processors, including MIPS, uh, which I put up there because MIPS is an important embedded processor. So it was already portable enough, modular enough, that we could port it onto different CPU architectures. So following on from that, 1996, uh, it was ported to the uh, Motorola 68K, uh, mostly because, uh, as a result of a bunch of people working on uh, putting Linux onto Amigas and similar uh, desktop systems. And also onto the PowerPC, that because um, uh, Macintosh uh, PCs at that point were running uh, PowerPC uh, on PowerPC hardware. And then 1998, an interesting thing happened. Um, an evolution of the M68K port uh, was uh, taken and a bunch of people hacked it around until they got it to work on a thing called a Dragon Ball, which is a uh, 68,000 but without memory management. And it's the chip that was used in the Palm Pilot. So Palm Pilots were popular at that time. Obviously, we want to hack it around and want to get Linux running on this thing. So these guys managed to do that. And in so doing, they did some interesting things. So first of all, no memory management. So they had to hack out the memory management uh, code of Linux. And they produced UC Linux, uh, which is still around today. They needed a C library that supported UC Linux. So they produced a C library called UC LibC, which is still around today. And the third thing that came out of that uh, was uh, a build system, uh, which evolved into build root. So from that bunch of hackers came three important components that are still in use today. UC Linux, UC LibC, build root, all came from that, uh, from that particular point in time. And then 1999, ARM is surprisingly late into the, uh, uh, into the list. ARM processors were kind of rare up until that time. Um, 1999, they, a bunch of people working with the, um, uh, the Sidewinder. Who made the Sidewinder? I can't remember. Tim would remember. You worked on it. Uh, no, I worked on the um, one from Sharp. Oh, I'll come into that. I'll come into that. <laughs> Anyhow, 
So uh, a bunch of people working on this thing called a Sidewinder, which is an ARM-based PC, uh, produced a, uh, um, an ARM-based Linux port. Okay, another key technology for embedded devices. Embedded devices don't have spinning hard drives. They don't even have floppy disks. They have flash memory. So work on this started in 1999. Uh, that's when Dave Woodhouse started work on the memory technology device layer, or MTD layer, which we still use today, of course. And close behind that, uh, a, a Swedish company uh, called Axis, who do network products of various sorts, still in business today. Uh, they produce a thing called uh, the uh, 2100 network camera, uh, which was running Linux. It has some NOR flash memory. So they used the MTD layer to access the flash memory. And then they had to implement a file system on top of that, which uh, they called JFFS2. Sorry, JFFS, the Journaling Flash File System, version 1. And JFFS is still, well, for many years, it was the, uh, the main uh, flash file system. It's still a commonly used flash file system. So by that time, where are we up to now? 1999, by that time, all the pieces are in place. We can actually start doing interesting things with Linux as an embedded OS. So 1999, this is the tipping point uh, at which Linux became an embedded operating system. And it started being built into real products that you could go out and buy. So the Axis uh, network camera I've mentioned already. Um, another important one was the, the TiVo, the TiVo uh, video recorder. That came out in 1999. Uh, TiVo at that point was running a PowerPC uh, 403 chip, I think, 16 megs of RAM, not, not that much, uh, and a gigabyte hard drive. No, I'm wrong, a 14 gigabyte hard drive. And then this thing over here. Um, how many, any, anybody here got one of these things in, in a cupboard or any, anywhere? Anybody, anybody seen one of these things for real? You've seen one, okay. So the, these, these things are all almost mythical. These are about as mythical as, as dragons, um, except that they do actually exist, whereas dragons don't, unless you think they do. Um, so the Kambango, why, why is that there if it never actually made it? It's, it's one of these products that got, that got canceled. It's important because uh, it kind of jump-started uh, well, one particular company, a company called Montevista. Uh, they kind of jumped it. They, they, they were the, the company who... Uh, did the software for the Cabango, and uh, it got a lot of people, well, a number of people uh, up and running on that. But the other thing I remember from, uh, from that, actually I think it was the year later, 2000, uh, Cabango were bought out by 3Com, and they, they took over product, and then they screwed it up, and then they canceled it. But the fact that 3Com, at the time, uh, a, a big, well-respected networking company, were prepared to consider Linux as a viable operating system and this kind of thing. That was the big thing. A lot of people commented about this uh, in the press and similar things. So the Cabango, although it never actually made it to be a, a product you could actually go and buy in shops, it had an influence. Which kind of brings me on to uh, the next stage then. Once we have the capability, the technology cap technological capability to put Linux into these things, um, we need, of course, professional help to help us do these things. So at this point, a number of companies popped up. Actually, the first off the block was TimeSys, who are still going. They don't get mentioned quite so much, but we'll come back to those uh, in, a, in a short while. Then come Montevista, as I've just mentioned. They Throughout the uh, early 2000s, they were one of the key motivators behind uh, embedded Linux or Linux as an embedded OS. And they started out with the, with the Combago thing. Uh, also, at this time, we have Linio. Anybody here from Linio? <laughs> Tim, of course. 
was uh, part of that uh, project. One of the founders, and I also helped turn the lights off. <laughs> <laughs> Start to finish. Um, and also uh, Denks, a uh, German software company, which we'll come to in a minute or two. Uh, these guys all were kind of doing stuff that was necessary to help. Let's face it, all these people making these devices, the hardware engineers, they knew nothing about Linux. They, they definitely needed some help. OK, the next phase of the um, story I want to tell is uh, the story of mobile, which is an ongoing one, as we, as we know. And again, as we go through this, hopefully it will become obvious why I think this is important. Um, we've kind of covered one aspect of this already. Uh, the Palm Pilot in 1999, uh, the Dragon Ball, uh, UC Linux, UC LibC, uh, and Buildroot. That was really the first uh, part of the story. But the next bit I want to go on to is handhelds.org. OK, so how many uh, people in the audience have worked with or were were involved with handhelds.org. Uh, one, two, people lurking at the back. <laughs> Good. Handhelds.org is another one of these uh, organizations that's had a big influence on Linux as an embedded OS. So it started off when IPAC released, uh, when Compaq, rather, released the IPAC. Now, the iPad is a, is a nice bit of hardware, even now. It had an Intel strong ARM processor. It had, I might get this wrong, 32 megs of RAM? 16 or 32, I don't quite remember. And it has some flash memory. I think 16. 16, okay, 16 megs of RAM. But it was, um, whereas the Prime Pilot, you can only just about run Linux on it. It was kind of, you had to, a bit of a fiddle, you had to, plug in an extra module and such like. You can run Linux native on an IPAC uh, 3600. So this is a nice device for Linux. So this is uh, a screenshot from one of the earliest uh, ports of Linux to the IPAC. Uh, it's just running an X server, and it's just running a couple of standard X applications. It's running X size down there, and you can see the X logo, and there might be X, X scribble, is it called? The little paint thing that uh, it runs directly on top of Xlib. But it shows it can be done. As a side note, um, so handhelds.org was the uh, organization that kind of coordinated people working on this stuff. So as a side note, they had a problem with cross-compilers. Uh, so the way they did go around that is by doing native compiles instead. So over here we see the build cluster uh, it's not a very good photo, but you can see there are three uh, compacts on this row. There are one, two, three, four, five on the top row, and a couple of others as well. So essentially, they had a cluster of IPACs, and you could get an account on one of these. You could SSH into it. They had compilers installed, so you could then do a native compile on one of these uh, devices. It may take a while, but it would work. Uh, and then you download the binary, and you can try it out on your own local uh, machine. For, for storage, they all had, uh, they're all networked together onto an NFS file system. So you had the storage to actually store the compilers and all this kind of stuff. So, interesting way of doing things. Uh, and a lot of people, um, well known in the, in the business now, started out at uh, handhelds. Uh, so, Michael Optinacker is not here from Free Electrons, but he, for example, uh, started out with, uh, with uh, handhelds.org. And some other things we'll come to in a few slides' time. Again, as a bit of a side note, but it's kind of interesting. Um, one thing, uh, 2001 this is, um, a guy called Jim Gettys, who at the time was working for... Uh, um, uh, um, Compaq? Yes, this must have been, must have been right about the time that uh, Digital, uh, the Compact bought out Digital, because I think Jim, Jim, Jim Gettys was originally with Digital. So he had uh, a project uh, called Project Mercury, and the idea was to, as a proof of concept, 
take a, an IPAC and turn it into a mobile communication device. So they produced uh, a sleeve, uh, which is this kind of thing you can see black either side. Uh, and inside that sleeve, there was a uh, GSM uh, modem, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. There was an accelerometer, so it knew way, which way up it was. Uh, it had a IBM micro drive, one gigabyte of uh, spinning storage. I don't know if any of you guys remember. I'm not micro drives. They're little one-inch hard drives. Yeah, at least one person over here has used one. So they were the biggest uh, storage, biggest and smallest, sorry, biggest capacity, smallest physical size storage device you could get at that time. And it even had a camera. Interestingly enough, it was a, it was a uh, front-facing camera, so it was ideal for selfies, although we didn't know what the, that's what they were called at the time. So this thing was, um, they produced a small number of these, maybe 100 or so for uh, development and just to see what could be done. And it was dubbed the unobtainium because uh, when people asked if they could buy one, they said, no, it's, uh, it's not obtainable. So it became the unobtainium. And again, this goes down in history. But essentially, this is, um, this is an iPhone uh, quite some years before Apple got around to doing this. Okay, continuing the story of mobile then. So this is probably the first commercial device, mobile device, uh, running Linux. And uh, it's the PDA, so it's a kind of big brother of the, of the iPac uh, and the Palm Pilot. Uh, the Linux for this was provided by Linio, and uh, Tim over there uh, worked on that. Okay, so now, 2001, we're seeing Linux being deployed not only in kind of uh, the, the TiVo and, and, and such like things, but also in mobile devices. So it's pretty, pretty quick off, off, the, off, the, off the mark to get into mobile. First reference I can find to a real uh, handset running Linux is the, this one here, the Motorola. So Motorola did a whole series of uh, handsets running Linux, starting as far as I can work out with this one here, the A760. Um, wasn't released in uh, US or Europe, uh, but was uh, somewhat popular, I believe, in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, Linear, unfortunately, did not get the, get the contract on this one. This one went to uh, Monte Vista. Uh, asked me in the hallway about the bids between us. It was really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Linio and Montevista were, were in uh, kind of competition, kind of fairly hot competition at this point. So, yeah, there's a whole story there to be told. Uh, moving on a bit. Um, so this is uh, a really nice little, little piece of hardware from Nokia, the, uh, uh, the 770 web pad, as they called it. Uh, it's basically um, an iPad, but again, somewhat uh, before Apple got around to it. It's running uh, the MIMO operating system. And MIMO has quite a lot of uh, commonality between uh, what was running on the, uh, on the Compaq uh, 3600 at, uh, uh, at handhelds.org. And indeed, a number of the people from handhelds.org actually did the software for this. Okay, next stage uh, of the story. At the beginning, if you wanted to put together an embedded Linux uh, system, you had to do it from scratch. You had to do a, a role your own, an RYO. Uh, implementation. Um, and whilst that's fun and you can do lots of interesting things, it becomes tedious when you've done it several times. So we have a number of uh, tools that have evolved to help us build uh, embedded Linux distros. BuildRoot I've already mentioned, 2001, that was split out of the uh, UC Linux project. And BuildRoot has been through a, a number of uh, 
uh, peaks and troughs, but it seems to be on a bit of a peak at the moment. Uh, so that's a, that's a good tool for small systems. Um, from uh, the handhouse.org bunch, uh, they needed a way of creating distros for their various handhelds. They came up with a distro called Familiar Linux initially, and then that morphed into Open Embedded. And of course, Open Embedded is the basis of Yocto. Uh, it's also the basis of MontaVista. Actually, does Monte, MontaVista exist anymore? Does, does it still sell products? I'm not a little over certain. They're acquired by Cavium. But do they still I, sell? I can I still buy MontaVista Linux? It still exists inside Cavium. You can. Okay. So that's still going, and the current version of MontaVista Linux, as far as I'm aware at least, uh, is uh, using Open Embedded as its build system. Um, then, oh, there's a little uh, company called Opened Hand. This is a British uh, consultancy company based in Cambridge, I think. Um, again, it was set up by a bunch of people from, from handhelds.org. Uh, uh, one of those people was uh, Richard Purdy, who is now a fellow of the Linux Foundation. And he produced uh, a variant of Open Embedded called Pocky Linux. He tells me, by the way, that it's Pocky to rhyme with hockey, not Pokey to rhyme with hokey. So it's Pocky Linux, I'm, I'm reliably informed. Um, and then uh, Opened Hand got bought out by Intel. So Intel ended up with a Linux distribution they weren't quite sure what to do with. So uh, 2010, they spun that off as the Yocto project. <clears throat> Anybody here from Yocto? Oh, well, only, only, only four people. So uh, again, we can see um, uh, uh, history going from uh, the current Yocto project all the way back to uh, handhelds.org there. So we came, uh, I was talking about uh, routers and the um, RLAN wireless how-to uh, a couple of minutes ago. So let's follow that branch of the story again and see how far that goes. And one of the catalysts in this branch of the story is the uh, Linksys um, WRT54G uh, router. This is probably uh, the first router, the first Wi-Fi wi router running Linux. And it became quite well known because a number of people started hacking it and putting different versions of, uh, of Linux on there. Well, actually, before that, before the people, first of all, had to get the, the kernel sources out of Linksys, and there was a bit of a controversy, controversy about that. Eventually, Linksys put uh, the GPL source code up in 2003, as the GPL license requires them to do, of course. Um, this then spawned the OpenWRT project, uh, which is still very popular, and it now supports a wide, very wide range of uh, Wi-Fi routers. More importantly, from my, point of, from my um, opinion, is the fact that it also signaled uh, the move to using Linux on domestic Wi-Fi routers and similar equipment. OK, the next strand of the story. Um, you can't really talk about embedded without talking about real time. In fact, some people think they're the same thing, though obviously they're not. So in the early days of Linux being an embedded, considered as an embedded operating system, everybody said, you can't use Linux for embedded uh, devices. It's not real time. You need a real time operating system. So a number of people started work on that's not necessarily true, of course, as, as we now know, but uh, that, was the, that was the perception back uh, at that time. So a number of people started work on how to make Linux real-time. And essentially, there were two ways of going about it. One way is you implement a real-time scheduler, and then you run Linux on top of that 
uh, basically running as the idle thread of the scheduler. So you, the real-time stuff runs first, and then when there's nothing else to do, you start running Linux tasks. And that's the technique implemented by uh, RT Linux from FSM Labs. Um, FSM Labs were not particularly open source friendly, and a number of, a number of controversies resulted from that. Um, with the result maybe that an open source project uh, uh, sprung up uh, shortly afterwards uh, called RTAI. And then there were some issues about patenting because uh, FSM Labs had a patent on certain techniques which they claimed RTAI was using. And so then, uh, jumping forward to 2002, uh, at the suggestion of a person named Karim Yagmour, they uh, came up with a different way of routing the interrupts, uh, a thing called ADIOS. And so, 2002, we have the ADIOS RTAI uh, solution, uh, which again is still going today, so far as I'm aware. And also in amongst that, uh, another project called Zenomai, Zenomi, not quite sure how you pronounce it, um, using similar code, similar techniques to RTAI uh, came along as well. So now you have kind of two choices. You can use RTAI or Zenomai. The second way of making Linux real time is to change the way Linux works and make its scheduler more real-time. So this has evolved uh, in a number of steps, really starting, well, actually, the very first step was done by uh, TimeSys. Um, they produced uh, Linux slash RT uh, back in 2000. Unfortunately, again, they were not particularly open source friendly. They, their, um, Real-time extensions to Linux were only uh, binary blobs in kernel modules. They never released the source code. So that died pretty quickly. However, uh, Ingo Molnar and Andrew Morton separately and then together came up with uh, a simple series of fixes to the Linux kernel to make it more responsive, the so-called voluntary uh, preempt patch. And then a year later, a guy called Robert Love came up with a, the preemptible kernel. Up to that point, the kernel had never been preemptible. Once you started doing something in the kernel, you kept on doing it uh, until you either exited back to user space uh, or you actually blocked on a, on a, uh, a blocking I.O. operation or something. So Robert Love's patch made the kernel fully preemptible. Well, not fully preemptible made it somewhat preemptible, meaning that on an interrupt, we can actually force a reschedule, even if you're running kernel code. Uh, then in 2005, we have the fully preemptible kernel, uh, the preempt underscore RT patch. Again, Ingo Molnar was the uh, first mover on that. Uh, Thomas uh, Gleixner uh, has done a lot of work on it since. And that gives us a pretty good real-time uh, scheduler uh, within, main, within Linux. Uh, unfortunately, it never made it into mainstream, or at least not all of it. Um, I haven't actually updated these slides since I gave them in 2013, but uh, uh, 2013 and 2014, uh, the preemptive patch is still not part of mainline Linux, and maybe never will be, which is sad. Okay, so that then brings us up to the present day. So where are we at at the moment? In terms of mobile, uh, these figures are uh, somewhat out of date, but at Google I.O. Uh, June last year, 
uh, they announced that they were, have, uh, they were experiencing one and a half million activations per day uh, for Android. I imagine it's somewhat more than that by now. So the installed base of Android uh, is roughly a billion. Uh, so that's a billion users of Linux out there. So that's probably the biggest single uh, Linux community that we have. But there are a lot of, uh, well, there are a couple of other areas that we should uh, consider as well. Um, Set-top boxes mostly run Linux. Smart TVs mostly, mostly run Linux. So I did a bit of research. Um, I came up with a figure of about 250 million set-top boxes per year. So that's another fairly large um, uh, population of users. Wi-Fi routers, we looked at that earlier on. There are about 200 million, 200 million of those sold per year. So add that up together, I reckon it comes to about 2 billion users, concurrent users today of Linux. So Linux is the dominant operating system. There is nothing that comes close to Linux. And it's predominantly an embedded operating system. It's only by accident it happens to work on desktops and servers. OK, so that's the end uh, of the story for the moment. Uh, the slides you can get on slideshare.net. Uh, I was going to put the URL on there, but then the network died, and I couldn't actually find the exact reference. And there is also uh, an expanded version of this timeline uh, on my blog. And uh, it basically is the same kind of format, except I, I've done it per year rather than per thread. Uh, but it kind of goes through going mentioning all the stuff I've mentioned uh, up till now, plus extra background stuff and, and links and such like. So if you, uh, and again, I'm, I'm continually updating this. If any of you have uh, any, or well, spotting any, any inaccuracies in this, what I've said, which is quite possible, I'd be interested to know uh, uh, and expand on the story. If there are any bits I've completely missed out, again, I'd really like to know that because I want to keep this updated. I want to keep this as a, uh, a living document. So I say again, any questions, uh, any uh, updates to that? Yes, sir. I think what would be interesting, and I, I liked your word, uh, uh, choice of activations. Uh, I would like to know how many Windows and iOS activations there are to compare. Yeah, does anybody have any sense of that? I mean, I've made several orders of magnitude Windows less. Has, I, would, I would say fewer. Of the market. Definitely fewer. Yeah. I think that, because I, I really appreciated that slide. Good, we'll get back to it. <laughs> well, well, hopefully they'll give us an update at um, Google I.O., which is, uh, I don't know what it is, in June or something? It's usually in June. I, I don't know the exact date. Maybe somebody here can, does know the date? Yeah. It's in a couple of months, anyhow. I recall seeing a Nokia smartphone, which I understood ran Linux, sometime before the 770. With one of these uh, clamshell things, and I don't can't tell you much more than, than a vague memory of seeing it at a trade show. Um. Okay. I so far as I'm so far as I understood, uh, the Nokia 770 tablet was the first Linux product they they they, they sold. There may, it may have been a demonstration uh, device. The caption one is probably the Nokia Communicator. And as far as I remember, that's Symbian. Was it Symbian? I, I would say so. The, the, the first, just to complete that, they, they, uh, the Nokia N900 um, was the first Linux phone that they had. And that essentially was, was the web pad with phone, uh, with a GSM modem added to it. Tim? So one area that I think is underrepresented uh, is because they kind of flew under the radar. They didn't really advertise they were doing Linux. There was a whole line of, uh, of children's toys, interactive toys that were like kind of mini computers, uh, like the Leapster, that were running Linux. Uh, and in very, very low footprints. Dave 
uh, mentioned that in the, the panel discussion this morning. And uh, I mean, they had a whole line of products, and, they, and uh, I don't know very much about it, but uh, be worth. I know there's a couple things on the Elex Wiki about it. it. Might be worth trying to chart out. Kind of okay, the that's so that, that was the, the Leapster you mentioned. Yeah, I think. It's and Leapster. what was the thing that Dave uh, was talking about this morning? I think I think that was the Leapster. I, that was I, the Leapster. I'm, I'm not sure. Well, see, there's. I don't know if Dave was talking about. I don't know if he actually worked on it or if he did like Linux as an after. Because a lot of people would buy these uh, products, you know, most famously Tim Riker, but it ended up with like, I don't know, something like 10,000 pieces of equipment that some company decided not to sell and he had them in his garage and he was, <laughs> he'd, skip, he'd sell them to people, he'd put Linux on them and sell them to people. <laughs> it was some kind of telephone. Yeah, the, so. Yeah, the whole kind of um, toy aspect of things is something I'm completely unaware of, to be honest. It's something I should find out about. But yeah, there's a whole, uh, whole bunch of stuff there. OK, any, anything else? OK, well, in that case, I'll bring it all to a close. So thank you all very much for, uh, for turning up.